I want to start the discussion by talking about uh, a story from one of my early days when I was first learning to be a scientist and doing my early work for my dissertation. That research led to, to, to my life. It, it led to looking at how we communicate with sentient animals who we have really strong relationships with. What I was looking for in my dissertation was do people use the same kind of sounds to speed animals up and to slow them down, and do they do it because they work inherently, or do they do it just because we learn to do it through sort of cultural transmission? You know, your mother taught you to do that. And, and so I had recorded whistles of sheepdog handlers. And two of them were, no matter who I recorded and what dog they were talking to, they were very similar. The speed up whistles were all short, rapidly repeated notes. Walk up, walk up, get up, walk up. And the slow or, or stop whistles were all a single note. And, and often they were long and descending, like, whoa, easy. And I was actually sitting on a little Arabian horse. And he was prancing too much. And I was like, whoa. And I realized that's, that looks on a sonogram or a picture of sound just like the whistles that people use to stop their border collies. And I was like, well, that's interesting. Oh. So I, my horse stopped. And so I did what I was taught to do. What do you do to get a horse to walk forward? Right? Which is exactly structurally like to get a border collie to start moving up and increasing motor activity and moving the sheep forward. And, and I literally, it was one of those moments in science that we are all feel privileged to get. One of the most exciting things about science is an opportunity to discover something. And I felt like I'd made a discovery. It was like there was this universal structure that we all sort of knew, but nobody had really looked at it in terms of animal communication. There does seem to be, if you look at all these different fields, universal responses in training, they call it, to, to certain kinds of sound. Short, repeated notes tend to speed up activity. So if you're, if you're trying to stop your dog, is the best thing to say, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> It's not, right? Right? But, but usually the reverse mistake is made. I'll see people calling their dog to come, and they say, Ginger, come! <laughs> and, and, and what's even worse is because we're primates and we're not dogs, and because we're very social primates, we do what most primates do if we want to engage with somebody. So if I want to engage with Susan, I'll go, Susan, right? That in dog language means stop. So people say, Ginger, come. <laughs> and Ginger's like, OK, I'm, I'm not going anywhere near you. <laughs> a lot of the questions and the problems that we have with the animals we live with are often because we're one species, they're another, and sometimes we don't understand each other. And it's my argument, and I'm going to throw it out to you now, it's my argument that it's our, we're supposed to be the smart ones, <laughs> right? So it's our job to try and see the world through their eyes as best we can and try and understand how they interpret what we do. A uh, dog is 98% a great dog. Under certain circumstances, he turns evil, and that is when he's in a car and sees another dog. I think dogs become defensively aggressive in cars. They're trapped. And there's this tiny little trap space, and they know they're trapped. And, they, and so they have this extra defensive aggression, basically. It's so common for dogs to be much more polite <clears throat> the more freedom they have to move. But there's actually like a hood-like thing. It's not blinders. It's that you put over a dog's eyes, and they, act, they can see. They can see, but it dampens what they see. It's like sort of looking through a thick screen. And it was developed for that exact reason by Trish King at the Marine County Humane Society. And it works really well, really, really well. Are dogs self-aware? My present okay. lab always investigates other dogs. I don't own any full-length mirrors in the house. And if I'm at a place where she encounters one, 
She doesn't investigate that dog. The whole question of self-awareness in non-human animals is just a huge one and a fascinating one. And there's a long history of belief that no non-human animal was self-aware, that only that it was a unique trait to humans, only humans were self-aware. And then there was some research done in the 70s. This really brilliant psychologist had some captive chimpanzees. And first he put mirrors in their cage and let them get used to them. Then he, he, um, he anesthetized the chimpanzees so they wouldn't know that he had painted a little red dot on their forehead. Then when they woke up, they didn't know they had a red dot on their forehead. But they went in front of the mirror and they went like that. So the interpretation of that by the scientists was that's proof that, that chimpanzees have self-awareness. So the question is, do other animals have it? And there are a lot of people doing research on it. But it's very much ongoing research. So are dogs self-aware? I think probably, but the research is not in. I have um, a pug and I have a Boston Terrier, Sully and Gully. Sully loves to sit on Gully's head. Why is he doing this? I've known um, quite a few dogs who would sit either on a cat or another dog when that individual was being um, either noisy I've had a lot of clients whose dogs literally would sit on another dog when it was barking a lot, and they would just sit on their face. <laughs> and, and I mean, the only possible interpretation is like, this is the only way I can shut you up. I have five dogs, and one gets very aggressive with the two older dogs, especially if I am paying attention to the older dogs. Mm. Is there anything I can do to calm or train the aggressive dog so that he doesn't attack the old dog I'm paying attention to. To that question, I have a booklet called Feeling Outnumbered that is all about either preventing or treating relatively mild to moderate cases of that, which is basically just teaching dogs that you get what you want by being patient and polite. You don't get what you want by throwing your weight around. So there are whole, there's several exercises in it, you know, and one is, um, one is I think it's a great idea to teach, to teach dogs basically um, to do downstays just you know every once in a while every evening because you ask them to because it teaches them Im impulse control it's very it's very often um, treatable but this because it sounds like there's some pretty serious aggression here this would be a great case a great time to bring in a dog training professional who knew how to use positive reinforcement and classical conditioning who doesn't use just teach them who's dominant method because that very often elicits aggression. We'll go out on walks and sometimes he'll see other dogs, no reaction, not at all, and then other times, just mm -hmm. randomly, he will go berserk. And I just right. was curious and if why? you had any idea of what's up with that. Yeah, it's, <laughs> but that's such a good question because, you know, so why, why is there no pattern that you can find, right? And it's true that as a behaviorist with a behavior problem, especially one like that, we're always looking for a pattern. There's probably a pattern that, that we're just not perceiving. But the other thing to keep in mind is, is that they're also just like us, and they're not always in the same emotional state. Say, one, your dog didn't sleep well. Seriously. That happens to dogs like it is to people. They had a long day. Something stressful happened to them. Then they got corrected and they didn't understand why. Then, um, then another dog walked by and nothing happened, but the dog was like, your mother, you know, which dogs do. Anybody here ever, right, like yelled or something because like you just had one thing after it was just too much, right? It happens to dogs all the time. And so one of the things when you're trying to solve that kind of a problem is to act, I'll ask people to keep a journal. Is what happened that day. You know, it doesn't have to be a long, elaborate thing, but just keep track of what happened that day. And often you find patterns when you didn't think there were any. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, oh, yeah. Dr. Thank Patricia you guys. McConnell. Thank you.